Thank you all for being here today. Um, we have with us Susan Brooks. She is three-time former mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, and she is here today to talk to us about Rancho Palos Verdes yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Susan Brooks. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. Uh, well, good morning, everybody, on this wonderful rainy morning. Uh, so thank you for braving it here in probably one of the st worst storms Drop of water. Yes, that we've had in probably decades. So um, I am honored to serve the community on the Rancho Palos Verde City Council. And uh, we I was asked about six months ago, actually, Leanne, originally had asked me to um, put together something. She had originally asked me to, thank you, put together uh, a program which required a little work on what the city was like in 1993 when I was mayor the first time, uh, what the city was like in 2018 as my term as mayor last year, and what I envisioned in the next 25 years, in 2043, when I will not be the mayor. <laughs> and uh, this is actually uh, likely, um, th this is my swan song. This is my last term. We have term limits, and I'm very thankful for that, to work with new people to bring the city forward so I can join the rest of you in, in retirement or whatever. Um, um, but by the same token, uh, we love our community here. We are the whole Palos Verdes community at Peninsula Seniors, are we not? So we have a lot to, we, sh we share the same geographic area, we s share the same school district, we share the same library district, but we have four distinct and separate cities. Our city, Rancho Palos Verdes, is um, the largest of those four cities, and we therefore carry the largest budget. Uh, we have um, uh, the, we basically have most, if not all, of the parks, and we really do what we can to reach out. That's our goal. So what I'm here to talk with you about today is yesterday, today, and tomorrow what we've envisioned uh, in the past, not when the city was incorporated. You had Ken Dida, he did a wonderful presentation here for you on that. And he also is back on the city council. So some of us just can't get enough. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna take you through this little walk through a little bit of the history that I've been through here um, with this wonderful uh, Rancho Palos Verdes and Palos Verdes Peninsula that we've been so blessed to live on. We are, in fact, losing many of our <clears throat> zoning opportunities, many of our land use issues that made these four cities join in when they did. The state has been coming in to take over several of these. And so we'll be getting to that. But the more that happens, the closer the four cities get together. We work very closely together. And I'll be with um, several of those representatives this afternoon at the Sanitation District Board meeting, right? We have to have a sanitation district. You gotta think about that. Okay, so I'm gonna start this little presentation now, and I wanna thank Vanetta over there. She's standing and sitting in the corner. <laughs> Vanetta Augustine, come up and stand up. Vanetta has really helped on yeoman's work. She's our uh, staff member uh, at uh, Rancho Palos Verdes and she's helped with this tremendously with this PowerPoint. I've never done a PowerPoint, so true confessions. Uh, we worked this out together, and also to Gabriella Yap, our deputy city manager. So, uh, let's see, we're gonna try this together. Ooh, paper airplanes. Okay, so in 1993, um, that was the time I was mayor, uh, in 1993, what was the city like at that time? Uh, and in that era, okay, we had just come off of some several challenges, but let's look at what the demographics were. So our city is seven and a half rocky miles of coastline. It's actually more than any other city on the peninsula in terms of the amount of coastline that we have. 
And so therefore, we are very subject to the California Coastal Commission when it comes time to address any kind of activity or development. So in 1993, it says the population was 41,659, and that was actually taken from the census in, uh, in 1990. It was more like exactly what it is today, folks, 43,000. So we had the same population actually when the city was founded, believe it or not, in 1973, as we do now in 2019. So you might want to think about why that is. How many of you have raised your children and raised your families here? Everyone. Guess what? You guys are still here. Are your children still on the Palos Verdes Peninsula? Many of them have moved, or they can't afford to live on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. So what, in fact, we see happening now is that we have a graying of the peninsula that I want to be able to address as we move on today. Um, and in 2043, uh, what are we looking at? We're looking at um, probably an increase in population. One of the new situations that have happened with the state is that they have said that there is a housing shortage and that we have to, um, they are going to mandate that we have um, accessory dwelling units available to everyone. So that means that all the zoning that we have in our respective cities where we had, um, for example, no, uh, you, you, no uh, con garage conversions, they were illegal. Now they're legal. And garages can be converted into accessory dwelling units. So that's likely going to bring uh, an increase in the population as we move along throughout the whole Palos Verdes Peninsula. Uh, this legislature has been making, just superseding what the local city's rulings have been. And right now we're trying to fight the cell tower invasion and the state and the federal government are coming in with all sorts of rulings and we do not, we are not gonna go down without a fight. So I hope that you guys are gonna be with us. Uh, we have basically have about 12,000 homes on the Palos Verdes Peninsula, probably more like about 15,000, uh, 13,000 actually now. Um, and you can see the racial makeup is pretty much the same as it was. Uh, it was 72% uh, Caucasian in 1993, 56% now, Asian American, 20% in 93, 29% now, and then the changes are pretty, pretty incidental on the way down. So basically our makeup has remained the same. This was the city council in 1993. Believe it or not, I, I'm in that picture somewhere. But, um, oh, thank you. We have, um, so at the time that I was mayor, Steve Kuykendall uh, was mayor pro tem. He went on to be an assemblyman and a congressman for one term. And then I think did what everybody else does in politics these days, a lobbyist. Uh, so Councilwoman ba Jackie Backrack went on and joined, uh, formed her own Council of Governments, which is very successful here in the South Bay. It's called the South Bay Council of Governments. Councilman John McTaggart, whom this room is named after, uh, was the longest serving uh, mem ongoing member of the Rancho Palos Verdes City Council. And Councilman Robert Ryan, Bob Ryan, um, any of you remember Bob Ryan? He was my mentor, and he taught me a great deal uh, about the city. He was 20 years with the city, and um, he basically, um, he passed away very young. Uh, he was only 64 years old, so that was kind of untimely, but he was a great contributor, as were everybody else here on this city council. In 1993, think about it. I mean, we were just working with our little laptop, uh, not laptops, our computers, gigantic, with DOS. Remember DOS? Um, so the World Wide Web was actually just becoming a thing. Uh, and we really had no technology in the city. Everybody who wanted to communicate with the city council 
would get their, they would get their packet of information actually a week before, and then they would send their mail to the city, and we would have all this, all the emails we get, hundreds of emails, hundreds. All that mail would come in, um, in mail that we would have to open. And we would, I remember Bob teaching me, he said, this is what you do. You get your table, you get your chair, you get a big trash can, and then you get two, uh, two lines. You, you make two piles, one to keep, one to give to the staff, and one to throw away. So it was always our, you know, what to respond to, and we always use them with the meetings. So it was a lot more cumbersome, but it's actually more cumbersome now because it's a lot easier to email than it is to send a letter. So we get a lot more emails. So it was just being introduced. Fax machines, they were new, but they were new and they were working. And we did receive a lot of faxes. We still use faxes. And so it was a much slower form of communication. Here's a little, we have a few comics that we've interspersed uh, for seniors here. Um, so this is the beginning of the internet, right? Dating, right? Internet dating. And there's the woman on the left and there's this curmudgeon on the, whatever he is, on the right. And uh, she's, he says, hmm, you're a model? Cool, I'm a Chippendales dancer. I also race speedboats. What's your sign? So. It's just a little story about how we know that we're, there's a lot of dishonesty on the internet, right? And somebody says, where'd you hear that story? I heard it on the internet. Well, in the beginning, we all believed it. A lot of people believed it, but now we know better. And we know we have to be careful about all these phishing, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G scams that are taking place. Uh, in 1993, there was a big battle for the bluffs. Uh, we had a situation with Marineland. Remember Marineland? How many of you remember Marineland? So there was a time we, that was, I, I fought the closure of Marineland with my family who are here. My daughter, my former spouse are here. And we had a wonderful time at Marineland. We loved Marineland. But uh, obviously it was not meant to be. Uh, that's actually that person getting kissed. Remember when you used to be able to get kissed by Corky? Well, I was fortunate enough to get kissed by Corky. That was me in the left-hand corner. And uh, over here on the right, they had a very small pool. They took them over to SeaWorld and they renamed them all the same name. Do you know what that was? Shamu. <laughs> so stupid. Anyway, um, well, we, there were a lot of fly, fights on the bluff top for development. So that's what's so important because we went to the Coastal Commission on a lot of challenges. And so marine land closed. It was very, very controversial that they took this greatest uh, resource we had and who took it? And then took those whales in the middle of the night over the landslide took them down to SeaWorld, many of those animals died, and what ended up happening was that, that land um, stayed dormant for 17 years before Terranea actually came into place. And uh, it was quite, uh, it was very cathartic. How many people worked at Marineland? Yeah, we have a couple of people here that worked at Marineland. That's wonderful. Oh, yeah, and your, two, or your children or whatever. Yeah, I'm going to take some questions in a moment, in a little bit, okay? And then, uh, so the public was very upset about it. These are just some, some newspaper articles that we have from it. Um, and in 1993, this city was on a shoestring budget. The city was broke. Uh, we, the city prided itself in, when it was formed, in, le you know, just really being a very bare bones kind of city. I mean, look at our city hall 45 years later. We're in army barracks from Nike missile site barracks from World War II. That's kind of challenging when you're a destination city now, which is what we are. But in 1993, we had a $10 million budget 
And we were $2 million in, we had a $12 million budget and we were $2 million in the hole. So what we had to do was privatize our parks. So we had park programs like the programs that we have here throughout the peninsula. We have wonderful park programs and um, I would just say that uh, over here for you today, we have some information on both PV Transit, Dial-A-Ride, and our, our um, newsletter, which I think should be award-winning. And inside of it, it, we have our park programs. Um, okay, and so like we have a whole guide for our park programs now. But back in the day, what we did was we canceled that through the city, and we ended up um, having people phone in with their classes and each class instructor would do it with their own registration, which worked for a while. It worked for many years. You know, when the city of Rancho Palos Verdes was acquired, was created, we actually ended up adopting all the parks on the peninsula, except for two, what, one at the time and now two, Ernie Howlett. And now, of course, there's one in Hillcrest Meadows. But we basically, um, people didn't want the parks because they cost money. So we had 11, now we have 19 parks. And uh, people love parks in communities. So we had, at that time, we barely were operating. Uh, so the, many of the roads were left very unrepaired. Um, potholes everywhere. So I took a map of the whole city and I went to the then city manager, Paul Bussey, who was a wonderful city manager, and I said, we have to go and look at each of the streets. And I started with Dauntless Drive down in Palos Verdes Drive South, went completely around the hill and I just said, we need a program in this city because there is none. And there were potholes on every street. Literally, every, your street that you lived on, there were potholes all over the place. That's not the situation today. Um, wait a minute, what did I miss there? I missed something about, let me try to back up here. Okay. Um, Right, and then of course we had the landslide issue, which we still have today, but we're going to be uh, giving you some information on that. Everybody was always trying to solve the landslide challenges, and we had a lack of funding to try to stabilize that, which we tried to do even back then. Uh, at the time, we were looking at the issue, what to do around the development, which what, which what is now Trump National, it was developed by Barry Hahn and the Zuckermans, remember, and that's how Ocean Trails was started. So that actually took 13 public hearings before the Coastal Commission, and I went to all of them. And that was a battle to get that area. And in that, we were able to still maintain precious habitat. So it was a really, really, um, I think it was a very positive thing for this peninsula. And we just moved along in a, in a much more positive way from then on. So we had our 20th anniversary on the, uh, in 1993, and we've just finished celebrating our 45th. On our 20th anniversary, uh, we, because we didn't have any money in the city, uh, Marilyn Lyon, who later became a mayor of the city, she became the volunteer coordinator and headed up a whole group of um, residents to, to help form our 20th anniversary events. We later had a beautiful event that year at the Vanderlip Estate. Um, we had it, uh, Ellen Vanderlip, who has since passed on, uh, opened up her tennis court and we had, it was tented, it was first class, it was a beautiful event put together by, completely by volunteers. And we also had our own beer. <laughs> so uh, RPV 20 Golden Lager, it was made by Southern California Brewing Company of Alpine Village. And uh, it debuted in our Peninsula liquor stores for $2 a bottle. Uh, so f actually, it was, I guess, later $8, or was it oh, $2, right, Vanetta? 
and, and five cents of each bottle went to helping to raise fund to finance the 20th. That's why it was so cheap. And uh, that was a great thing. Uh, Ray Mathies, who actually is one of the founders of the city, actually brought this photo to us. And he is alive today, and I wish he were here today, because he continues to live the legacy and the legend, and is a legend in his own right here for our beautiful city. Okay. Um, Quality of life. In 1993, there was smoking in restaurants. How many of you remember that? How many of you like that? Okay, uh, no, right? But that was a huge battle. Uh, we were the first South Bay city to actually go with no smoking in restaurants. And I actually brought that forth to the city council. I'm kind of the renegade who brings these new ideas that are not so new because we already had a couple hundred other cities in California. That whole tradition began in California and moved east. And now those were the days when you could say, as California goes, so goes the nation. I don't know that I'd want to see that legacy with what's going on right now. <laughs> Um, but uh, the O2, you can see it was an oxygen-deprived um, area. And some of the restaurateurs had a real problem with it, and they later came back and said, wow, they didn't realize how offended people were by the smoke. And in fact, their patronage greatly increased. So this landslide, this famous, famous landslide, it is the largest landslide in the Western Hemisphere. That's our claim to fame. Remember when we used to have a big sign that said, caution, active landslide? Well, OK, so I guess we didn't want to scare too many people because they thought they were going to go over into the ocean. Um, and now that we've become this destination city, it's a little different. But um, at that point, the council, the city, was looking to relax the moratorium on, on home construction in some of those areas. And uh, it was still deemed to be unstable. So we have an application before the city right now to build homes in some of this area that is not zoned for this. So we shall see what will happen if anything changes. In 1993, public safety, we had Captain Bill Mangan. He was a wonder. We've been so blessed with great captains of our sheriff's department. So we have the Lomita Sheriff's Department. Palos Verdes Estates has their own police department. At that time, we did not work with Palos Verdes Estates. Today, we work very closely with Palos Verdes Estates Police Department, I'm proud to say. We share that same land mass. We really have to share the same public safety information, and we do. So uh, crime rates were relatively low. Remember, we, we didn't have AB 109 and all these new laws that have come out that have since brought a lot of people out of jail a little early without a program. And so we've had to deal with this. So um, Neighborhood Watch was begun. That's when Neighborhood Watch started with Gail Lorenzen. And uh, Jackie Backrack actually brought her to a meeting, and we began the Neighborhood Watch program here, which is still very effective today. And oh, this is some city events. We had uh, the longest running marathon in the nation was run by the Kiwanis organization, of which I am a member. And uh, that was the marathon on the left. That was me at the finish line there. And this is what the hill looked like in 1993. You can see that area now behind him. That's Terranea. This all happened really in the same location that it does today. And we just I just kicked off their, their next, they have a half marathon now. We just kicked it off in November, and uh, it's ongoing. So um, now over here on the right, we have um, Chinese uh, New Year in February. And guess where that location is? Anybody know? Golden Cove, correct. That's Golden Cove. And what's in the background there? It, it's the Montessori school, but it used to be Safeway. It used to be Safeway. 
And so that location right there is outside of the restaurant that is now at the Trader Joe's, which it was the Golden Lotus. Golden Lotus. <laughs> Thank you, John. And, and so it is clearly a, a community that we love. And that was John Bodorf. He really created and did this whole Chinese New Year um, program for the whole peninsula every single year. And actually, he passed away recently, and his daughter still comes for special events here that we do. She lives actually here in the beach cities. So, you know, YMCA. <laughs> so this is AARP, <laughs> the Retirement Village people. So this is just your little, um, your little humor for the moment. Um, Nobody here looks like that, thank God. Okay, here we are today, 2018. Well, we're in 2019, but at 2018. So technology and communications, we can't get enough of it, or we get too much, right? I mean, look at them doing PowerPoint, oh my Lord. Um, the city is highly dependent on technology now, and uh, we have to do that in order to be more effective. Uh, we, have autom for, we have automatic license plate readers that we brought in, um, and they are very effective, 45 of them around the whole peninsula. When these criminals come in, thank you. When these guys come in, it taps, uh, beeps, to, uh, it beeps to the sheriff's department, and when they uh, come in with a stolen vehicle or an, uh, a felon that may be driving this, it it will tap that stolen license plate or that vehicle, and they come, like the Roach Hotel, I'd say, you know, they go in, but they don't go out. They don't get out without getting arrested. One, it, because we have only five ways you can get on and off the peninsula. That's not too bright to come here and think you're gonna commit a robbery and get away with it. So we have been very effective with that. And we do that together with Palos Verdes Estates. So we have a, our financial system is one of the, if not the most transparent financial system, high tech system, despite our location in that paltry building, we have some really wonderful people, high tech people, wonderful staff, a great city manager. I, I think the city has never functioned better than it is today. Uh, our instant communications with residents, uh, we use the, the listserv, we use the city's emails, we use the website, we have social media, we actually have a Facebook page, um, and graffiti reports. We actually have an app for your phone um, that you just download, and if you see graffiti on your walk, if you're using the trails, uh, you just tap it, your location, and within 48 hours, it's gone. Why is it so important to remove graffiti immediately? Anybody know? Because it, it grows. If you do not, this is the big problem that we've had historically in the nation. When you would see the graffiti on the subways, they just gave up. I mean, I'm from New York. I, you know, like, that was the art. But I have to tell you that at one point it became way too much and it will grow and grow. So what we do is we zap it immediately. They are not going to get away with tagging their gang names or any kind of crazy tagging. It's unsightly and we're, we're not doing that. So it's a wonderful, we contract with this great company and it's very cheap. So it's very good for the taxpayer. Okay, next. We have responsible development at this point. That is Terranea. And Terranea brings our city revenue in the form of transient occupancy tax. When you go to any hotel, right, you always see this like 10, 11, 12% hacked onto your bill. Well, ours is low right now, it's only a 10. And I believe it's probably gonna go up, but we got $5.7 million from them last year alone. And each year it's been growing. So there is this move underfoot by uh, unions to try to force some unionization there. And uh, apparently 
the, uh, the employees in the hotel have been circumspect about be wanting to be involved because then they would have to be paying union dues, and it seems that many are happy. There have been controversial issues, but regardless, that's something to look at um, for the future and be educated about on both sides. We have this little postcard here that you can't really see. I'm gonna pass it around, and you can get this at Terranea, and it'll show you what Terranea was like um, in, 19, in 1986 and what Terranea was, uh, what Terranea when it was marine land, and what it's like now. So you just, I only have a few of these, sorry, to pass around, but uh, Terranea uh, is a world-class destination, wonderful hotel, uh, five restaurants, uh, 14, eight, we have a 1,400 acre preserve now, which we have added. And it's very popular. Our biggest challenge is accommodating all the residents so that they're not impacted. And we actually had that addressed last night in several items on our city council meeting. Uh, I still think we need to look at, um, we have this wonderful preserve, it's great. We don't want to impact the neighbors. You know, who's ever heard of Uber and Lyft? Those are good ways to get into the preserve. And if you hike all the way down and you make it to the bottom, guess what? You can call Uber or Lyft and they'll take you home. So I, I introduced that concept last night. Like, is this really novel? Everybody has to drive a car? That's not what's gonna be happening in the future. We also have a program here in Palos Verdes. I mean, many of you have come in the rain to get here and it's treacherous driving in this rain. We have a program on the Palos Verdes Peninsula called Dial-A-Ride. Dial-A-Ride is $6 for anywhere you want to go on the hill if you're, if you're 62 or over or you have a disability. It's a taxi cab and we have, it's operated through PV Transit. I have that information over there on a table for you so that you can contact PV Transit if you're interested. It's only $10 to register, $6 for a trip. You get four trips to begin with, and you're in. And you get a little card, and it's kind of like your credit card. So and you can just reuse that on your credit card. It is a wonderful opportunity in these times when we might not want to be driving around in this weather. I can tell you, I did not like driving in this council meeting last night in that torrential rain pour. Did you see that last night? That was crazy. And trying to drive over the landslide? Forget, you really did think you were gonna go in the ocean. <laughs> so I couldn't see anything. Uh, so the, the city here is now fighting to retain local control. I told you about that. We are fighting the state. We're gonna need your guys to help us. We may end up actually going for that charter city. And if we do, we're gonna look at your support for that because um, that may be one way that we can control some of our zoning. Okay, next. Okay, fiscal soundness. So I told you about the terrible potholes in 1993. We now have the best roads in the state of California. Is that a great thing? That was just last year, we just received that acknowledgement. That was, Irvine was number one for many, many years and we just surpassed them. Because that maintenance program that we started in 1993 is a seven year maintenance program. Every seven years you get your roads repaved in our city. When you go to Torrance, don't we all know the difference? Right, as soon as you get on Hawthorne Boulevard, well, and uh, yeah, they have to deal with that issue. Uh, we have a general fund that was, I told you, does anybody remember what it was in 93? What, a, 10 million. Okay, it's 31 million now. And you know what, with that, we still are among the lowest tax base city in the entire South Bay. So, People stay here for good reasons because your houses continue to increase in value. You pay less taxes than you would in other cities. Um, the only challenge is if you wanna move, some people feel that they're stuck with capital gains. And so these are all challenges as people want to move. Uh, what is going to happen with that? 
There are, I believe, five counties now that you can take your capital gains with you to another home. You can take your same tax base, so you will not have to pay, as long as the home you buy is the same or less. Okay, and then, um, the, so the city does designate Terranea um, with our capital expenditures, and that's why our roads are in such great shape, because that TOT tax goes to, specifically goes to infrastructure, roads, repairs. You see the road, you see the guys out there all the time. You know, it's a shame. What are we having to do now? We're having to take trees down. Beautiful, beautiful stone pine trees in Mural Est that provided a canopy for that whole area are now, many of them are gone due to a disease, a beetle. The thing is with our city, do we let a dead tree stay standing so it can fall on your house or on a car? No, we don't. So if it's a city tree, you better believe we're going to come in and, and work with it. And we worked with the neighbors there, and they desperately pleaded for us to take them down. They were afraid. But it's changing. And so we have a view restoration program. We started it in 1993, and now we don't have many people applying because people have pretty much stepped up to the plate to keep the views. So... Uh, uh, this year, we just celebrated our 45th anniversary, and uh, this is our city council together with uh, Janice Hahn. She is our uh, county supervisor, and she uh, gave us money this year as well toward our celebrations. We had three of them, but we had Whale of a Day. Uh, that's going to come in April this year. It usually comes in March, but you know what seems to be happening every time we had it in March? Rain. <laughs> so we're having it, I think it's April 13th. Okay, so it's uh, the Saturday in April, the second Saturday in April. Uh, we have July 4th, where we have our wonderful July 4th activity. I hesitated to say this, but back in uh, 1993, we couldn't have it because we didn't have the money for it. Uh, the RPV Founders Day, and that was the day of incorporation. So Ken Dida is a real legacy in this city, and he is back on that council, and he is um, the youngest man there, almost. The youngest man there is actually Eric Alegria. He could be my son. Um, and uh, actually, Ken Dida wanted to make sure we had our celebration on the day of incorporation, September 7th. So we did. We had an event at Point Vicente. And then we had another day, a day at the park, um, on the Sunday. So we had many activities here. This just kind of shows you some of the activities uh, we had with the children, with Fourth of July, Whale of a Day. Um, the, uh, and so instead of beer, we have wine. So the wine bottles in the, in the center have our 45th logo. And I have a couple of pins that I can pass around if you're interested for our 45th uh, logo celebration. And these are some people in our community here. I see the Fords, and they're in this audience. And um, Bill James and Kathy. Bill is on our planning commission. This is our former, some of our former council members. Anthony Mizitich, you may remember, up on the right, while Ken Dida is signing his incorporation booklet. And uh, Jim Knight, another wonderful person. And Ann Shaw. Ann Shaw, who's the president here of Peninsula Seniors. So it's a really great opportunity. And then, of course, Jerry Dehovic is in the back with the sunglasses, and he is the mayor right now. So uh, we had a really lovely... And then there's two of our wonderful staff members that I just blanked out on, <laughs> Terry and Jackie. And so we have a great staff, as I mentioned. So we had a day at the park, and these are some of the children here that uh, enjoyed some of these activities with us. So in 2018, quality of life is really important. People were concerned about um, peafowl, coyotes, and barking dogs. Oh my. 
So if we continue to control the peacock population in a very unique way, uh, other cities seem to not be as effective as we are. We have about five communities that are directly impacted with, the, with peacocks to the point where it's, it became a huge, um, inter, a huge annoyance. And um, we found a very safe, humane, and productive way to transport them to farms. So they go to farms now in uh, Bakersfield, out in various areas, and they love their, the farmers love them because they do what? They chase the, they chase the birds away from the crops. I mean, it, it's a great, great thing. And they have some high pine trees, which is what peacocks love to rest in these high pine trees. So, um, yeah, if you don't want a peacock around, you might want to reconsider your pine. But by the same token, they're beautiful. And it was actually Frank Vanderlip who brought them here in, uh, in the early 1900s. And you've heard that story, I'm sure. But he brought them here. Somebody brought them to him as a gift. He had 25 of them, I believe. I see Leanne. Hi, Leanne. Um, uh, and they multiplied, right? So. That's what happened there. And then we have coyotes. How many of you hear the coyotes? Okay, so that has really become a serious issue. We formed a coyote management program. The city actually works together. Actually, our city founded it for the whole South Bay. And I'm gonna credit Ara Moranian, our planning director, with really implementing that program and putting it together. We work very closely with Palos Verdes Estates, Rolling Hills Estates, and Rolling Hills. Um, Rolling Hills probably has the most actively aggressive program, and uh, but we do everything that is needed on a gradated basis. And we work together with the County Board of Supervisors. They've allocated additional staff with weights and measures that come in. So we have agricultural people who come in if it's necessary. There is trapping that would take place. So right now we work in, in management and avoidance. We've been pretty successful in the last year, but it was pretty bad for a while. So we always have to keep an active eye on it. And the barking dogs. Who has not been bothered by barking dogs? Who has, who has been bothered by barking? So what does it do? It changes, your, it changes your peace, right? We come to this peninsula to have peace and quiet. People who come here will say, I can't believe how quiet it is in this area. It's so beautiful. So when there is a dog that is barking, of course, as a mediator, I can tell you the best thing to always try to do is try to see if you can talk with the responsible party, the adult. Dogs only cry, for, bark for a few reasons. They're hungry, they're bored, they're tired or cold, or, or hot, you know, hot or cold. Um, or, you know, the, many dogs just need company. Some of them bark because they get distracted. But in the hill, we live on a hill, right? So we have many terraced neighborhoods. Because the neighborhoods are terraced, you end up, when the dog barks, the bark reverberates down, down, and down. And likewise, it goes up, up, and up. So because of the land, it makes it even more challenging. So we have contracted with the county. The county has now got a new system. And this system is um, if you do not meet with success in meeting with your neighbor, then you can fill out an, a form on the county's website. It, it's very crisp and clear. You send it in. It's an affidavit that you can also sign. You can first do it anonymously. But the fines will go from $100 per occurrence and increase up to $500. So guess what? We haven't had too many problems lately. And I think that's been helping. Um, people need to get the message. But really, we're all human beings. So I always say, try to talk to your neighbor. Sometimes you have people who just don't hear it. Some people don't hear. And they don't hear it. And so you have to let them know the effect it has on you. If you say to somebody, put yourself in my spot, what would you do? 
then they listen. I find as a mediator, that is the most important thing, asking people to reverse their roles. Put yourself in each other's position. What would you do? So the, hopefully that will help. So we do work with the county, and it is being effective. And attacking the landslide. So now we have a new program. We've spent two, year, two and a half years now, uh, thanks to Ken Dida's insistence, this has been his main goal all along to get this landslide abated. So we found out that in, like in 1993, we had a geologist and we were doing wells and we were drilling straight down. Now we've learned that we were drilling the wrong way because they would come off their platforms. And so that drilling laterally, doing some, making some modest changes initially uh, is really going to help. And under that road, you know what's under the road at PV Drive South? Water. Water, which is why that road has to constantly be repaved. So what we're going to be doing is creating a revetment, like, a, uh, like drains around it. So this does not happen as well as a very comprehensive program. So hopefully in the future, we're not going to deal with a landslide. So our public safety is really the best it's ever been. Uh, our sheriff's department, we have 200, I just found out, 200 deputies, Lomita, alone. So that's a big deal. And now Captain Berenger was one of the best captains we've ever had, and he just retired. So we're waiting for, I, I think this new sheriff, Villanueva, is wanting the local community to help dictate who would be the next sheriff. So Mike White is currently doing the job. He's done it before when there has been uh, an, uh, an intermission. And he's doing just a fine job, a wonderful job. So we have the ALPRs, automatic license plate readers. We have the ring camera. How many of you have ring doorbells? Oh my gosh, everybody here, you know, many of you. So it's the best thing. And we had an incentive program. We were giving you more than half off. And so that we ran that three times. And the city was, it was very effective. Um, we have awareness campaigns, situational awareness. Now, without looking around, uh, Don, how many exits are in this room? Right. Well, well nope. Four. So when you come into a room with today's craziness that goes on in schools, goes on in communities, we, uh, we had a campaign that took place recently at the Norris Pavilion. And there was, um, who was the person, Liz, who spoke? Um, Don Carr? Anyway, this um, former agent, he ended up doing this presentation. And among the many things he talked about was being aware of your surroundings. Where are you? If you needed to get out quickly, would you know where to go? You, need, you just can't go through that door. There's that door, there's a door there, there's a door there, and guess what? There's a door back there. So there are four ways to get out of this room. So just try to make yourself aware of that stuff. But we're working on that with the communities. And then the homeowners associations, we have a security camera program and we've got a couple, two or three, maybe four now coming online. It's really important because the automatic license plate reader only reads the face of the plate. It doesn't read the face of the person. In order to capture the actual person, you need somebody with a camera. And not everybody wants to rely on everyone's home system. So we have these programs going on, and we do subsidize you uh, partially. So our crime rates are low. They were half of what they were in 2015 when this whole thing exploded. And we have growing ride shares such as Uber, Lyft, and Dial-A-Ride, as I mentioned to you. I'm going to try to move on quickly here. And there's a little cartoon, which I'm going to skip over so we can move on to. What do we see in 2043? Romper, stomper, domper, do. Who do I see there? Who do I true? Who remembers romper room? <laughs> OK, so kind of like a romper room kind of look into the future. Autonomous vehicles. Um, now, some will say we're only less than 10 years away from that. We know there have been some serious 
failures. But by the same token, 5G, which is a network that's coming, and the federal government's going to supersede it, uh, that's coming within five years. They look like pizza boxes, and they're going to be on the top of some of these hills, some of these uh, poles. That's the only way, place that they can put them. And they will, con they will coordinate everything from when the light changes, when you cross the street, to when you get in your car. So it'll make it actually, it should make it a lot safer. That's the goal. And all of the interface with everybody's computers. So here's a person relaxing in his car, right? Having a great time while somebody else is doing the driving. I don't know. And even the dog in the middle of the street. So <clears throat> we also will be looking at zero emission vehicles. So we will not be having gasoline powered um, use. We'll be looking at uh, electric, at hydrogen cell. So there will not be emissions in 2043. Uh, actually, it will be, I would say, within 15 years. Um, uh, vehicles, trucks, as we move toward electric and hydrogen. So, and they'll become more affordable and they will be the norm. So if you're driving a gas-powered vehicle now, you might want to think before going and buying a fully gas-powered vehicle for your next car. You might want to think about some kind of combination, a hybrid at least. Increased in the number of charging stations, including in multifamily housing. So, uh, and improving the air quality and reducing the climate change issues and increase in the solar use. So you're gonna see more and more solar. My son and his family live up in Washington State. Guess what, there are people in Washington State where it rains almost all the time with solar. We should all have access to solar and we should really think seriously about using it. So it's a, it's a great game changer and money saver. You will not see any more overhead, ugly, disgusting power poles. How many people hate those things? Yes, everybody. They're horrible. So we will not have them. And um, we are already starting. Uh, Councilman John Cruikshank, one of our councilmen who spoke here not too long ago, he is very, very active about trying to make sure we get this program underway for util underground utilities. And we're starting with the fire areas, because you know, all our major fires have been started with power lines in Edison, in the middle of, like near the preserve, so and, and high traffic areas. So uh, we are looking at doing that. It improves the aesthetics, reduces the fire risk, enhances views. Think about how many people's views will be greatly restored in order to um, get rid of these darn things. And future developments will, all future developments require undergrounding, by the way. And no more landslide, yay, no more landslide. That will be, Ken will only be 130, I think. Um, but he'll still be here. <laughs> um, and we will have continued fiscal responsibility in this city. We will continue, I believe, uh, conservative and strategic fund fund funding. Um, high property tax value due to the upkeep of neighborhoods and cities. We maintain our homes here, which is a very good thing. And the city will have developed more revenue bases while also looking for ways to improve efficiency and cost costs. We are always trying to do that. In 2013, the city of RPV is considered a destination city with attractions such as the Preserve, Terranea, Trump National Golf Course, and I, I'm going to just throw in for the heck of it, Gold Cove Shopping Center. <laughs> Isn't that not the best little place? I mean, look how great that became. It went from being pretty much a dud of a, of a shopping center to everybody wants to be there. You know, it's beautiful homes, beautiful views, Admiral Risty's there, and facilities. So hopefully by 2043, we will have a new civic center. We have a civic center advisory committee working with us right now. Ladera Linda is um, very close to, um, we're going to bid now. Finally, it's been only 20 something years that this has been worked on. So 
there are new families moving in, and you know what? The new families moving in, what's very different about them, if they can afford to live in Palos Verdes, they have a different lifestyle. They work from home. That helps in so many ways. It helps in Neighborhood Watch. You're watching what's going on. You see if anybody who shouldn't be there is, is in your neighborhood. And we have more of a neighborhood sense. I, I see in my neighborhood five new neighbors, all of them who moved in, all of them working from home. So that's why that peace and quiet I mentioned is really important too. So anyway, we have updated facilities and they all want to go and utilize updated facilities. So it looks like we have, um, you know, aging gracefully is a virtue. So why is lying about your age not a virtue? And age is only important if you're cheese, this guy says. <laughs> oh, right, and good wine. So I think that's pretty much um, just these are a few cartoons. But at this point, I'm thankful for being here, and thank you for listening. And at this point, I can take any questions and answers. Thank you.